Benvenute e benvenuti, and welcome all to this symposium, in which we will hear from the three finalists for the first ISNAF Award for Innovation in the Study of Italian Culture, sponsored by the Italian company RNB for Culture. For the few of you who might not know, ISNAF stands for Italian Scientists and Scholars in North America Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to connect, empower, and celebrate the Italian research community in North America. The foundation was created in 2007 at the behest of 36 prominent scholars, including four Nobel Prize winners, and it reaches the largest number of researchers from Italy who operate in the US and Canada across all disciplines. Thanks to the generosity of our sponsors, ISNAF confers Young Investigator Awards every year to outstanding early career Italian researchers working in North America in recognition of their significant and innovative contribution to the field, to their field of studies. This year, five awards will be conferred in the research areas of sustainability, engineering, computer science, hematological malignancies, and the study of Italian culture, which is indeed the award for which we are here, here tonight. These awards wants to recognize the vibrancy of research in Italian culture in North America and its evolving nature expressed in a variety of ways such as innovative uses of technology, originality of approach, or contribution to wider questions and trends in the humanities at large. Tonight, you will hear from the three finalists selected from a pool of applicants through a peer review process. They will each present their research accomplishments to a jury at, uh, as part of the evaluation process. Based on this, presentations and the review of the application materials, the jury will select the winner who will receive the award winner certificate and a monetary prize of $3,000. While the other two finalists will receive the award finalist certificate and a travel award. The winner will be announced at the ISNAF annual event organized on December 9th at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time in partnership with the Italian Embassy in the US. Save the date, the event will be virtual this year and the link will be available soon on our webpage. Let me now introduce to you our jury beginning with myself. I'm Claudio Fogu, professor of Italian studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I chaired this jury and in my spare time, I am a cultural historian of modern Italy. I am joined by two very dear friends and prominent scholars, Professor Graziella Parati, Professor of Italian Comparative Literature and of Women's and Gender Studies at Dartmouth College. He's a leading voice in the study of migration literatures and cultures of Italians abroad and new Italians in Italy. Professor Stefania Tutino is Peter Ryle Chair in European History at UCLA and specializes in the study of post-Reformation Catholic culture in Italy and abroad. I'm honored to be joined by Graziella and Stefania and thank them for having accepted to be part of this jury. Finally, let me give you an idea of how we will proceed in this symposium. The three candidates will present in turn in alphabetical order. Each candidate will speak for 15 minutes. Then we will have a 10 minutes Q and A that will begin with one question from each jury member, followed by questions that the audience can send us at any time during the presentation through the Q&A function. Then the second candidate will present, and finally the third following the same structure. Without further ado, let me introduce to you our first candidate, Laura Di Bianco. Hi, Laura is an assistant professor and director of undergraduate studies in Italian at Johns Hopkins University. And her presentation is entitled, Wandering Women, Urban Ecologies of Italian Feminist Filmmaking. The floor is yours, Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, 
a bit emozionata. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share my work. And I'd like to thank the Hisna Foundation and the members of the jury for this uh, opportunity and for being considered for this, this award. So I will give you an over, uh, overview of my book and I will share some images from the film that inspired my, my research. And uh, as Professor Fogo said, the title of my presentation is Wandering Women, Urban Ecologies of Italian Feminist Filmmaking. Over the past two decades in Italy, a country whose cinematic tradition had and continues to have a global impact, numerous women directors infiltrated a male-dominated industry and artistic scene. Such contemporary women-led cinema, though, suffers from invisibility. While scholars of Italian culture have increasingly addressing women's artistic and social marginality, my study distinguishes itself from other accounts of women's filmmaking for its use of the feminist ecological lens and its focus on urban nomadic narratives. I investigate the work of a remarkable group of eight women directors from different generations. Cecilia Mangini, Mariangela Barbanente, Marina Spada, Francesca Comencini, Alice Rothacker, Vilma Labate, Roberta Torre, and Eleonora Danco. Their vibrant cinematic production abounds with itinerant characters who wander around Italian cities and contemplate shifting landscapes of the Anthropocene. How do women assert their authorship? How do they position themselves in the cinematic worlds they create? How do women reimagine the places that shape their stories? Women wandering through urban space and practice in the practice of contemplating the surroundings through film inherently question the gaze as male privilege and the urban space as a masculine domain. This wandering also exemplifies the ongoing process whereby female subjectivity is constructed and a woman search for a place within the confine of a largely patriarchal society. The wandering woman, woman replicates the gaze of the directors and function as an authorial self-inscription as well as an assertion of female authorship in cinematic texts. The nomadic characters of these films wandering along the margins of Italian cities often represented as places of abandonment. Their walks and the landscape they bring into view tell the stories of Italy enthroned industrialization, pollution of the sea, the cementification of land and the erasure of nature in the city. The unusual emptiness of cities women traverse highlight the absence of and the wish for sustaining communities. I argued that while articulating a claim for belonging and asserting cinematic and social agency, women urban filmmaking brings into view landscapes of the ecological crisis in which urban decay and the erasure of nature intersect with human alienation. My approach to film analysis is informed by feminist, sorry. My approach uh, to film analysis is informed by feminist eco-criticism that asserts the interconnection of gender, racial, and species oppression combined with environmental deterioration. Leading scholar of environmental humanities, Serenella Jovino, emphasizes that at the core of the eco-feminist thought is the dismantling of dichotomies such as human nature, nature, culture, and mind matter, as well as the undoing of the master narrative, quote, in which the master subject, whether humankind, man, or colonizer, tends to devour every form of otherness, uh, respectively non-human, women, or the colonized. These theoretical perspectives and activist approach can provide tools of, to recognize women's contribution to environmental struggles, 
bring awareness to, of women marginal social position and invisibilities and potentially transform the narrative the narratives about the world we inhabit. Ultimately, our feminist ecological lens illuminates new expressions of women's filmmaking in contemporary Italy, women's eco-cinema. The interdisciplinary nature of this approach expands the realm of film criticism and theory. Eco-cinema is a strategy of reading, of reading films and the landscape they frame from women's perspectives, as well as in the context of film history, in light of changed perception of the world with the knowledge of the devastation and social inequalities wrought by abusive environmental practices. Furthermore, embracing the feminist practice of situated knowledge, I take a very personal and narrative approach to film criticism. My analysis is often introduced by accounts of, of encounters with filmmakers and imbued with reflections on how these films resonate with my personal story. As the daughter of a shipwright and a housewife from the south of Italy who grew up in the periphery of Rome, as the first woman in my family to get a, a university education, as a breast cancer survivor, as a white privileged yet nomadic subject myself, thinking between two languages, Italian and English, feeling home between two countries, Italy and the United States, living in between two cities, New York and Baltimore, and producing scholarship from the multidisciplinary crossroads of Italian studies and environmental humanities. Now, I will give you a brief overview of the films I discussed throughout the, the five chapters of my book. Uh, chapter one, the opening chapter examines the documentary film In Viaggio con Cecilia, directed by Mariangela Barbanente and Mangini. The two directors traveled to post industrial cities of Taranto and Brindisi, where a younger Mangini shot films that portrayed the transition from agrarian to industrial society and uncovered the entanglement of social inequalities and environmental decline. Four decades later, Mangini's film appeared prophetic as the industry collapsed and left those cities both impoverished and heavily polluted. Incorporating footage from Mangini's earlier, earlier films and engaging in dialogue between directors and current inhabitants of these Apulian cities, this film gives Mangini original work a new audience while also giving voice to a resilient and mourning population. Taking us from the south to the north of Italy, chapter two examines three films set in Milan directed by Marina Spada. Come l'ombra, il mio domani, poesia che mi guardi il mio domani. Spada constructs her authorship by inscribing herself into, into a place-centered uh, artistic production rooted in Milan that includes film, poetry, photography, and painting, while also contributing to the recovery of the women's artist's work, such as poet Antonia Pozzi. By eschewing the absolutism of the patriarchal gaze, Spada's transient Milanese narrative weave a fabric of the city that allows for gaps temporal and spatial continuities and discontinuities, urban and rural voids. Chapter three explores the, the different uh, di dimensions of care in Francesca Comencini's films, Lo Spazio Bianco and Mobbing Mi Piace Lavorare, both of which tackle the experience of single motherhood in contemporary society. These are stories of survival and care that unfolds in the urban environments of Naples and Rome, cities that are surviving and transforming much as the subjects who inhabit them. Drawing from Adriana Cavarero's concept of maternal inclination and feminist ecological conceptions of care, I argue that by showing how women take up the burden of care and condemning the violence of neoliberal economy on women's bodies, these films contribute to an understanding of how care is vital to the survival of humans, non-humans and places. 
Chapter four presents three stories of girls surviving in the impoverished southern cities of Reggio Calabria, Naples, and Librino near Catania. Alice Rockbacher's Calco Celeste, uh, Vilma Labade's uh, Domenicas, and uh, uh, Roberta Torres' I Baci Mai Dati. While transitioning from girlhood to womanhood, the, the young female protagonists direct their gazes toward deteriorating urban environments. Simultaneously, they expose the collapsing structures that family, state, and church supposedly provide for bil building life-sustaining communities. The protagonist walks through cities, though seemingly detached from nature all and at the sea, yet this is not at end at all. Rather, it signals possibility for the future. The concluding chapter is devoted to Incapace, a mesmerizing film by performer and play, playwright and filmmaker Eleonora Danko. Blurring the boundaries of fiction, documentary, and art performance, uh, and Incapace explored the emotional struggle of an artist who questions her credibility to make a film. The errant protagonist who traces on foot, or, or travels on foot between Rome and her coastal hometown of Terracina bears a name appropriate for all the female characters portrayed in Wandering Women, Anima in Pena. I engage with a series of memory installations and other forms of exhibition in public space. I assert that these are performances of authorship, symbolic gestures of appropriation and reimagining of places, as well as protest against urban deterioration through a call to protect the beauty of ancient artifacts and places. Ultimately, Danko builds what I call a psychogeology of the city. She digs in both her and in her soul to comprehend the undecipherability of life. Similarly, I bore into the affecting landscape in which the protagonist places herself, both they uh, unhurting both their symbolic and material significances to foreground on and off urban ecologies. Um, the five, as the five chapters discuss, women as represented in these films are, are often lonely and estranged from the world. They have suffered losses. They struggle to reconcile paid work and motherhood or to embrace motherhood. But they also give voice to resilient communities, make gestures of hospitality, find the strength to fight abuses, learn to care and spiritedly defend beauty. They take walks of mourning, they embark upon searches for lost friends and mothers as symbolic and real. They undertake marches of protest and they take journeys of awakening and self-discovery to re-engage with the world. They take life restoring walks. The Italian landscape they behold from their peripheral positions are not the pleasing harmonious views of the Bel Paese, but troubling landscapes of the Anthropocene. The views from above that so often appear through these films show overwhelmingly built up landscapes, streets strewn with garbage or improbably sanitized antiseptic streets. Piazzas that would normally appear teeming with people are empty, rather eerie. These voids are signifiers of the absences of members of the community lost to pollution induced illnesses or the pandemic we live in, in the, in the lack of nurturing mothers, individuals isolation and invisibilities, uncertainties about the past and the future. As I contend, we must see this landscape to be aware of the progress of the Anthropocene and accept the invitation to reimagine those empty piazzas, streets and alleys, not merely as pre-trauma scenarios or mournful landscapes, but also as spaces of possibility where communities might, try, might form and thrive. All the films analyzed in Wandering Women are instances 
of an eco cinema. They cannot alone heal ecosystem, but they can lead to concrete changes in how individual and societies live locally and globally. You have Indeed. two minutes left. Indeed, this is a minor cinema that although deeply embedded in its national cinematic tradition far transcend its national character in its treatment of women's condition in contemporary society and for the ecological concern it expresses. Thus, if released from invisibility, eco-cinema can have a global impact. Films, as Sophie Myers writes, enter our imagination, our intimate and political fantasies. They shape our interactions, our conversation, possibly our revolutions. They are the storks that deliver us and we can be the storks that deliver them. Delivering to readers, viewers, ecologically engaged peripheral films is only one is, is one of the vital tasks of eco scholars, a collective endowment to which my research give only a modest contribution as Italian cinema continues to address the ecological crisis and the body of stories of urban and rural resistance and cohabitation grows, hopefully reaching broader audiences. My work, our work continues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite Stefania first and, and then uh, Graziella, or Graziella first, <laughs> or, and Stefania to actually um, ask maybe a question from Laura or make a comment. And then um, um, I will wait for um, questions from the audience. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you, Laura, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's extraordinary work that is absolutely necessary and very important right now. I would like, I have a question that, um, uh, that connects to something that, that I have worked on a little bit and, and I, I think of quite a lot, which is the ethics of care and come and, and moving away from care as women's business and so ethics being women's business and moving it into a much larger dimension and scale. So how do you deal with that in the context of a book in which it, you talk about women and therefore how do you avoid falling into the problem of talking about women and typically care at the same time? How do you move out of there? How, do you, how can you add to the discussion without uh, you know, getting trapped into the old stereotype? Well, first of all, I have to say, uh, this was a very challenging chapter to write uh, because it deals with motherhood and, uh, and, uh, and, and through two films are very, very peculiar film. One is Lo Spazio Bianco that deals also with, um, with maternal ambivalence. Uh, so I try to, 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 to connect these two concepts, the, the, the idea of, of care as a practice, uh, uh, but also as an inclination and the idea that um, it is uh, nothing natural to, but it's a choice that a woman, uh, that a woman uh, uh, choose. And it was complicated by the fact that these, these um, films were placed uh, in an urban context. Uh, and, and women are often essentialized uh, and, and thought as closer to nature. And that's why they naturally care for and they take care of other human beings while I was observing this in an urban context. The second case, and, and, and so again, the first case studies that delves into the issue of maternal uh, care and in conflict with maternal ambivalence. Uh, and the second case study is more about the practice of care and deals with, a, uh, with a workplace harassment and show how, how the, um, neoliberal economies violent upon women's bodies be precisely because women have to take care 
especially when they 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 uh, they are mother outside the structure uh, um, of the family of the traditional family. Uh, what are the consequences uh, of the lack of the crisis of care that um, a workplace harassment uh, triggers? So um, I don't know if I answer your question, but. Um, Again, uh, this was, a, I, I think the care is a huge concept uh, and I was um, looking at, at this concept precisely through this, uh, these situations, that of single motherhood uh, in an urban context. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Again, you know, really beautiful, very imaginative presentation. Um, Thank you. I, my question is, so it starts from something that you mentioned about you being a Southern Italian woman and then mattering in your, as a fellow Southern Italian woman myself, my question is, I noticed that some of the directors are from the South, some are from the North, you know, some of those urban mm. landscapes are, you know, Southern cities and some are Milan. So did you notice any um, implication of the South-North divide? into the issue of eco-cinema, or is it rather that those concerns almost cut across that divide um, in are, some are you, ways? Are you talking about the geographical provenience of the, of the uh, filmmakers? No, I'm talking about the fact that oh. some of the cities that are protagonists in the movies that you mentioned yeah. are Roma, Rome and, and Naples, whereas others are Milan, the city of Milan. So does that matter somehow? Does that uh, well, this change is a very good. That's a very good question, I must say. I would say that um, uh, the films of Marina Spada, who are probably in the audience, and if she is, hello, Marina, thank you for being here, are uh, certainly portrayed different kind, kinds of cities compared to Roberta Torre, who is original from Milan, but sets her story in, uh, in, in, in Catania. But there's something peculiar in, uh, in all the cities that I represented, that these films represent, they kind of, um, they often uh, lose the distinctive characters of the Italian cities. They are portraying some peripheries of the world. Thank you. Uh, I think Claudia is trying to say something, but yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> I try to unmute myself. Thank you, Laura. Um, um, in fact, I'm, I'm still reminding the audience, if you have any question, please uh, write them in the Q&A. But I would like now to exert my right <laughs> to ask a question. And Laura, I was interested in, in something uh, that um, I think you you sort of bring it out in towards the end of your presentation. Um, is the positioning of this group of women that you chose, how do we see it within both the Italian environment, cinematic environment, um, in terms of maybe diachronic a little bit, maybe if there is any reference, for example, to the work of Antonioni that might be oh, just yeah. post kind of referent. And I'm not trying to sort of bring it heavily, but is it something that uh, transpires? Is there a dialogue with that kind of tradition? Um, and specifically, how much do you see this as a women kind of eco uh, system, <laughs> I would say, as opposed to a larger framework within which, for example, Rosie's uh, documentaries might also be seen as participating um, in some of this, I mean, and, you know, with the differences, but um, I, of course, I was interested in seeing it, how much of a dialogue or how much of an in-group is, is being created. Okay, we have this two more minutes. So, such a wonderful question. I just wanted to briefly um, say that um, about the position that they are, the marginality of this cinema was what, um, was attracting me. The, the fact that they were working from the margins of the film industry and uh, with the exception of uh, 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 directors like uh, Francesca Comencini who then became mainstream, but you know, the early production was very much marginal and same for others uh, 
um, and, and so but the part of the argument is that this sense of exclusion, this marginalities is it, it leaves an imprint in their in their films. Uh, and as for the the dialogue with the uh, with maestri padri del cinema italiano, it's it's all over, and I uh, and I engage very much in, into the intertextual dialogues with with uh, the films of Antonioni are particularly present in the work of Marina Spada. Fellini is also reinvented uh, in, uh, in Roberta in Roberta Torre, and you know, and, and an, an artist uh, like Alice Rochbacher has you know very much, uh, and then she engages very much with uh, the Sika or Olmi and other um, directors of Italian cinema who thought deeply about uh, about the relationship between humans and the environment. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, thank you. Look, thank you very much. And so I would like to now uh, greet our second uh, finalist, um, uh, Julia uh, Rico, who is an assistant professor of Italian at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Her presentation's title is Sao Paulo, San Paolo, a transnational approach to Italian studies. Thank you, Claudio. I'm going to share my screen now. Well, hello, everybody. Buonasera to those of you who are um, joining us from Italy. I know there are some of you there, including one of my best friends, Agnese Selmi. Thank you for being here. Um, before I begin, I would like to extend my congratulations to um, the other finalists and also to thank the jury who selected me. Uh, I'm honored to be here today and to have this opportunity to share my research with you. So um, in this presentation, I will first illustrate the contributions of my current research to the study of Italian culture. I will then explain the originality of its approach and the innovative outputs which resulted from it. Uh, I will then discuss the significance of my work for the humanities at large. I look forward to any questions or comments and I just wanna make sure are the slides working? Um, yes, great. Um, so, transnationality, modernity, and race are the three keywords that define my research on Italians in Sao Paulo. First, let's talk about the transnational nature of my research. Transnational because it studies the making of a specific Italian identity in Sao Paulo. It may come as a surprise to some to know that today, Sao Paulo has the largest concentration of people descended from Italians outside of Italy. This was the result of an aggressive plan formulated by Brazilian elites in the 19th century to whiten the country, to subsidize migration from Europe. So in sharp contrast to the US, where as scholars of Italian American studies have, have argued, Italians existed as racially ambiguous subjects. In Brazil, Italians were putatively white. So by moving away from an Anglo-centric approach to the study of the Italian diaspora, I uncover an alternative Italian identity made in the Americas. In addition to the fact that Italians in Sao Paulo were considered putatively white, they also existed as agents of modernization. Their arrival in Sao Paulo coincided with an overwhelming economic growth. On the one hand, we have a booming coffee economy, the reason why Italians had been brought there in the first place. And on the other hand, the recent abolition of slavery in 1888 initiated the transition to a free capitalist market, which in turn meant that Italians could favorably start new businesses. Not coincidentally, some of the wealthiest industrialists in the first half of the 20th century in Sao Paulo were Italians. The combination of these factors meant that Italians first became recognized as modern white Europeans in Brazil, particularly in its larger city, Sao Paulo, which developed at a faster rate than much of the Italian peninsula. To a certain extent then, the Italian identity created in Sao Paulo 
challenges commonly held ideas about the belated arrival of Italy to modernity, and moreover anticipated the civilizationalist discourse advanced by Mussolini. An interesting fact about the arrival of Italians in Brazil has to do with the way Brazilian racial theorists envisioned a processual erasure of blackness from Brazil through miscegenation. At first, Germans were actually the immigrants they went after. However, Germans soon became a danger because they would not mix with the locals. They would instead recreate small German speaking communities. It turns out that Italians then, who at first were considered a second rate class of immigrants, became the more racially desirable group because they tended to marry outside of their national group. So revealing how Brazilian racial theorists ultimately favored Italians over Germans as model immigrants allows me to overturn conventional narratives about Southern and Northern Europeans. Paradoxically then, Italians' racial superiority existed only insofar as they fulfilled their primary function, that is to mix with the local populace. So while still implying racial superiority, the Italian identity that takes shape in Brazil diverged drastically from the one endorsed by the liberal, fascist, and even democratic Italian national project. It is an Italian identity that emerges from a national reality that had to contend with the existence of multiple races and that idealized racial mixing at the expense of black bodies. It is an Italian identity that even in its more conservative and racist expression has to contend with the impossibility of claiming a pure idealized whiteness. Last but not least then, my research on the making of an Italian identity in Sao Paulo subverts modern nationalist myths of Italian homogeneity and suggests new ways of thinking about Italy in a global multiracial context. My research is, an, is original in its geographical, literary, and multilingual approach to the study of Italian culture. Geographical because I choose to center the research in Sao Paulo, thus decentering Italy as the favorite locus of enunciation for the study of Italian culture. In this way, my research not only contributes directly to the recent transnational turn in Italian studies, but it further destabilizes geopolitical notions of Italy. Literary, because I opt to study immigration through discourse analysis more so than from a sociological or even historical perspective. By reading how Italians in Brazil or Brazilians themselves saw and interpreted the presence of Italians in Sao Paulo allows us to better understand how these individuals mediated their national identities. Multilingual, because I collect a corpus of texts in a variety of languages, namely Italian, Portuguese, Italian, and Spanish, which shows how one can think about cultural transnationality beyond the national quality of the language. I'm experimenting with the possibilities that an Italian multilingual classroom opens up in my course titled Family Resemblances, Italy and Latin America, which is open to students who speak either Italian, Portuguese, or Spanish. The originality of my approach to Italian culture resulted in a series of innovative outputs. So through my contribution as a guest editor and writer for the website Public Books, not only was I able to reach a broader audience, but I also proposed a different paradigm for thinking about Italian identity by including it in a larger category of global blackness. Along the same lines, in the classes I teach, I introduce students to more inclusive ways of thinking about Italy by having my class Shades of Black, for example, fulfilling the race and ethnicity requirement of my university. I value collaborations and conversations, and I see the university as a space that should encourage education beyond the classroom. So each semester, I organize events that include Italian artists and activists whose work speaks to broader political issues. At the same time, I developed a freshman seminar on Italian food that puts students in contact with chefs, importers, and restaurateurs based in an arbor. However, 
the most important output of my research, one that in many ways has al also allowed me the space for developing the originality of my approach, is the Transnational Italian Studies Working Group. I organized a round table for the 2020 conference of the Modern Languages Association, which is the largest meeting uh, for those of us who study modern languages here in North America. Um, because I was longing for scholars of Italian culture who like me found value in a transnational approach to Italian studies. Without the conversations with the colleagues and friends who constitute the working group, my research could not have developed the way it has. In fact, I see my current monograph on Italian identity in Sao Paulo and the Transnational Italian Studies Working Group to equally valuable contributions of my research to the study of Italian culture. As you can see in this timeline, what started as a roundtable discussion has now transformed into a fully formed group of scholars across American and European universities. Indeed, in August 2020, with Serena Bassi, a dear colleague and friend who I know is here in attendance today, we co-founded what we called the Transnational Italian Studies Working Group. We have been meeting regularly to discuss recent publications in the field and innovative ways to introduce students to the study of Italian culture. Most recently, I've been preparing for the launch of our blog through the HNET Italian Diaspora Network, which I also co-edit. The AgeNet system is an independent nonprofit scholarly association that offers an open academic space for scholars and teachers. In both my research and teaching, I see technology as a meaningful tool to foster community. Given the time limit, I won't go into how I employ technology in my teaching, but I am happy to discuss it in the Q&A. Having to use Zoom to connect with each other due to the numerous restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic, reveal how we could actually still have engrossing conversations from afar. I know this do not necessarily equal the face-to-face -face interactions with colleagues at conferences, but I still valued them nonetheless. As a matter of fact, the virtual reading groups that Serena Bassi and myself co-hosted gave a sense of community and common purpose at a moment where many of us found ourselves isolated. Similarly, the recent blogs published through the AgeNet system wants to be a digital forum for exchange and debate about recent trends in research and pedagogy in Italian studies. In this case, I am repurposing an existing online infrastructure that's of the AgeNet Italian diaspora, which was mostly used as a repository and transforming it into something new. So I understand innovation, not necessarily as getting rid of the old, but as a process of rethinking and of almost reactivation. To conclude, the awards instructions asked us to define the significance of our research within the humanities at large. So first, by geographically locating my study of Italian culture in Sao Paulo, my research proposes an alternative to the nation-centered methodology that has defined the study of modern languages and literatures. By focusing on literary texts organized around the experiences of Italians in Sao Paulo, a space to which Italy has never laid any political claim, I reveal how the study of a modern language and culture can transcend the geopolitical confines of the nation state. Second, my research shows how studying a modern language and culture from a transnational perspective allows us to demonstrate that diasporic voices can and should lie at the center rather than the margins of national discourse, introducing a new paradigm for thinking about one's own national identity. And third, my commitment to notions of community and collective work promote a more collaborative notion of humanistic research. As a matter of fact, within the humanities, single authored articles and monographs carry way more value than works that have been co-written or co-piloted. This premise creates the false idea that the study of Italian culture or any culture for that matter is done alone and in isolation. This cannot be further from the truth as I hope I have shown to you in this presentation. Connections, exchanges, dialogues are what sustain and push forward the humanities. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, Julia. And uh, as before, I invite everybody to uh, uh, forward a question if you have one for Julia. And I would like Graziella first and then Stefania uh, to maybe ask a question first. Thank you, Julia, for such a wonderful presentation. And while you were talking, I was thinking of a, a, a geographer whose name is Yi Fu Tuan, uh, who has worked a lot on concept of space and place. And he says that uh, space is what you dream of and place is what entraps you. And your presentation seemed to me to talk a lot about <laughs> spaces and places, right? And how to transform places into spaces. So. And you talk a little bit about uh, the, the place that <laughs> Italian migrants find in Sao Paulo and how they turned it into a, a, a space that they dreamed of. And um, <coughs> I'm very sorry. And how this reconstruction, transformation of, of places into spaces works in your engagement, I would say social engagement in Italian studies. <coughs> sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Graziella, for that question. Um, I'm, you're going to have to give me the name of the geographer. I'll have to ask you to write it for me. Uh, I, I really love this difference that um, they make between space and place, because really that is the case, right, that we, that, that we encounter when we begin studying Italian migration to Brazil and specifically the state of Sao Paulo, which happens uh, in very different forms um, than the one perhaps they were more commonly um, used to study, which is the Italian migration to the US, to North America, um, in the sense that um, a lot of um, the, uh, the push factors, right, of, of these Italians moving to Sao Paulo had to do with the possibility of owning land. So it was uh, very much going to a place and literally, fare la like they were literally fare America, right, in the sense that while, while the US was at a very different stage of development at that particular point in time, so Italians would arrive there in a somewhat already urban or somewhat already made America, right? When they actually went to Sao Paulo and to the state of Sao Paulo, they uh, found they found they found a true America to be made, right? And so, unfortunately for many of them, right, the, the dire realities that they encountered did not live up to the space they had dreamed. So the place truly kind of disappoints that uh, idea of you know. I'm gonna jump on this boat and I will be able to finally own the land and you know, to become you know, one of the richest coffee plantation owners, which is the case of one, which is the, the man we saw in the photo, Jeremia Lunardelli, right? But for many of them, uh, certainly the place at first did not live up to the space, right? That changes, however, with the movement toward the urban reality of the city of Sao Paulo, where Italians truly there had the chance to invest because, um, you know, despite the um, recent abolition of slavery, Black Brazilians were completely uh, left outside of that new booming capitalist market that we see. So um, Italians who might have saved some money, even just a little money working in the coffee fields, they move to Sao Paulo and they're able to truly make that space happen in, a, in an urban reality. So I hope, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you again. And my question, you know, is very sort of speculative in a way and um, personal in, in some sense. And it's about the question of identity, right? You know, the word identity is very uh, at the center of a lot of things, but you know, at the heart, identity means sameness, you know? Um, and your research, you say, uh, of course, you know, evidently, um, how do you put it? Uh, provides a new paradigm for thinking about identity. But I wonder, could you go further than that? In other words, would you really not just offer another way to think about identity, but in fact, kind of question profoundly the very category of identity. Um, how comfortable would you feel going a little beyond sort of theoretically speaking, um, 
the banking this issue of identity as in fact the most important category of analysis when you're dealing uh, in this case with nationality being Italian does it matter that much could we really really rethink you know uh, yeah that's it um thank you uh Stefania for this question and um uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you um, are asking me this because uh, um, I've debated a lot whether or not to use identity. So I, I, I find it you know, interesting that you picked up on it or that you, know, you, you find yourself asking, but what, you, what are you doing? Is it actually to propose this alternative pardon or are you trying to completely deconstruct it? And I think that it's the latter, right? So ideally what I hope my um, current book uh, uh, manuscript in progress, so I'm still very much writing it, wants to deconstruct that, that idea of identity in the sense that I don't know how useful it is for me right now. Uh, but unfortunately, I am still trying to figure it out um, an alternative to describe what I am seeing um, emerging right from the corpus of texts that I put together. So another uh, way that I've been uh, um, discussing it, it's actually um, discourse. So what I'm seeing emerging from the texts is not so much a uh, um, ready-made identity per se, right? But it's much more a narrative construction that you know, is performative. And so in many cases, the Italians that um, you know, um, populate the novels, the short stories, the political pamphlets that I read are very much um, fictional. And, and, and to me, what they represent is what I am now kind of toying with is, is the concept of new world Italians. So they, they are not, right, they, they, they want to be settlers. They want to be American in the sense of, um, you know, bringing forward modernity itself. So this is my answer to you in the sense that I am still very much working through um, that category. And so what sometimes I use in, in, in kind of parallel to identities is discourse insofar that what I'm seeing is this narrative construction in the various texts that I analyze. Claudia, is it okay if I follow up really briefly? I like this, you know, performative aspect of identity, but I guess, you know, like, back to Austin, right? What is the function of this performance? What happens? What takes place when you perform your Italianness? I think it's also an interesting question, right? If he, in fact identity is a performative a speech act, what's the effect, kind of epistemological effect that, that, that I'll just stop here, sorry. Yeah, no, I think it's an excellent, it's an excellent follow up in the sense that, I mean, the, the effect is that, you know, Italians achieve a certain type of racial, economic and cultural superiority in Sao Paulo. And so to be able to say that you have an Italian grandparent or great grandparent, uh, it immediately, uh, it immediately uh, allows you to assert a certain type of positioning within society, right, that others who do not have an Italian um, ancestor um, cannot claim. And, and this, I think it's possible in a society like Brazil, which is deeply racially unequal. There is a, Julia, there is a wonderful question by Rene Aragin Randall. Um, and I'll read the question and it's a, it's a two, uh, two parts question, but uh, uh, can you talk about how Italians and their discursive renderings of their identity in Brazil influenced Black and other Brazilians who were already there in their own efforts to shape their identities. In other words, how was their project precedent setting in this hemisphere? Great, thank you so much. Two minutes. Two minutes? Yes. Okay, um, great. Thanks so much, Rene, for that question. I do address this actually in one of the chapters in the current manuscript. Uh, in the sense that, as I mentioned earlier in my answer to Graziella's question, what we have is, you know, we have these two groups, which is Italians who originally moved to Sao Paulo to work in the coffee fields, that then are moving toward the urban center, which is Sao Paulo at that moment. And they find themselves in this urban space together with whom? The, the Black Brazilians, who had, had just recently been working as slaves in the fields, right? Who 
by no means want to stay in the fields. And so they're also moving toward these urban, urban spaces. And so on the one hand, we have obviously Italians not wanting to mix, right? So to a certain extent, right, they are brought there precisely to mix with the local populace, right? To, to, to fill this um, project of miscegenation. Um, but, but, but Italians and Italians are not conscious of this, right? Uh, but at the same time, that, um, that is almost impossible. Like in the sense it is impossible to um, uh, not mix. And so they, they are sharing uh, similar spaces. And, uh, and what um, I, I analyze in this chapter is actually two uh, black intellectuals, Jose Correa Lecce, Erlindo Viego dos Santos, who um, reuse what Italians, that performative that I was just talking about with Stefania, that, that, that idea that the, the Italianness is going to place you in a better position within society, they reappropriate it. So the idea of ethnicity becomes reappropriated by Black Brazilians in a way that allows them to then, um, you know, claim a certain type of ethno-nationalism that we had not yet seen in Brazil, right? And so this also speaks to another important difference with the US, which is that in Brazil, black Brazilians thought of themselves as Brazilians first. They saw Italians, Portuguese, Spanish as foreigners. And, and only in the 1930s are they finally realizing that in order for them to actually uh, be able to claim certain privileges, they also need to employ the same tactics employed by these ethnic groups and so claim their own ethnicity as the raza negra, right? So the black race. Um, I, hope, I hope I've answered that. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And I would like now to invite our final panelist, um, Ilaria Tabuso Marcian, visiting assistant professor at the University of Ohio, Miami, with a presentation on sustainable Italian food and farming cultures in the 21st century. Here, Ilaria, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Claudio. I'm going to share my presentation now. Please let me know if you can see or don't. And uh, thank you. So, grazie a tutti, grazie a tutti for being here today. Thank you. I'm very grateful for uh, for being selected as a finalist uh, from uh, ISNAF and also for the Air and for Culture Award. So, in this presentation, I will address how my topic of research and the approach I use contribute to new fields of studies and directions in Italian studies and humanities at large, and how I am planning to use technology in my current research project. My research contributes to the field of Italian studies by demonstrating the impact of Italian contemporary farming cultures beyond the national boundaries. Their role in helping to establish a paradigm shift and I dare to say with audacity, the need of a shift of consciousness when it comes to issues related to environment, sustainability, and the climate change in general, both at a local and a global level. Spanning the period from the Italian resistance during World War II to, to, to the present, I examine the role and image of the Italian rural world while exploring its significance and legacy in shaping contemporary farming cultures and food systems alternative to the food industry. So why do I focus on Italian farming and rural cultures? In my research, I see the two, Italy and farming culture, strictly connected and related. Historically, peasants have been marginalized and stigmatized as ignorant, unworthy, or simply seen and used as a labor force. Yet, as recently as the 50s, Italian peasants constituted 52% of Italian population. Exploited, forgotten, with very little to no presence in the Italian social and political panorama, they were defined, to quote the Italian novelist, artist, and activist Carlo Levi, a word apart. 
While socially marginalized, they have actively contributed through their practic practical knowledge and tireless labor to create the international fame of Italian landscape and to build the economic success of Italian food products worldwide. And right now I'm thinking, for example, of the number of UNESCO heritage in Italy, uh, I'm sorry, world heritage sites in Italy, 58 totally, which makes Italy number one right now in the world. And yet there are so many also that bring our Italian unique uh, natural and rural landscape and food heritage far front. And here, these are just few of examples. The intersection of Italian rural culture and tradition with Italian landscape has not been yet represented as studied as it deserves. I am referring especially to the Italy of the so-called are marginali, areas at the margins or fringe areas, the Italy of the small and rural villages located in less popular valleys, plains, and mountains, the carry cultures and local traditions that can today inspire and help change the dominant paradigm that brought us today to the current climate crisis. Italian peasant culture is at the root of what I call the phenomenon of the new farmers or new peasantry, as Jan Do van der Plagg defines it. The term new farmers refer to the alternative practice of small scale farming, urban gardening, international grassroots farming and food movements that promote and support ecologically sound and regenerative methods bringing together traditional practices and knowledges with contemporary techniques. These practices also address the social consequences, for example, food industry and movement, I'm sorry, food insecurity and movement related to the food uh, sovereignty and food justice caused by massive implementation of industrial agriculture. And so what is the originality of my approach and how does it contribute to questions and trends in the humanities at large? My research uses a comparative transdisciplinary approach within the emerging field of the environmental humanities that I broadly define environmental cultural studies. The introduction to the volume Italy and the Environmental Humanities, where I had the fortune and honor to contribute with my essay and interview to Carlo Petrini, stresses, and I quote, the traditional conceived humanities can no longer critically deal with the world alone, but must engage in conversation with scientific fields of study, ending quote. The environmental humanities are an umbrella that brings together the social sciences, the humanities, and the natural sciences in conversation to address contemporary ecological crises from ethical, cultural, philosophical, political, social, and biological perspectives. In my research, I include a transnational and comparative approach, and I begin in Italy. Starting from Italy, I investigate communalities at a global level. And on the other hand, I take the opportunity to bring to surface the uniqueness of Italian biocultural diversity. My research intersects history, literature, film, ethnography, political ecology, ecofeminism, environmental science, agroecology, indigenous studies and extinction studies, connecting Italian grassroots movement with peasant movements around the world. Through my approach, I attempt to bridge the gap between theory and practice, not only through the topic of my research itself, but also connecting texts and realities, cultures and practices. My ongoing project is a monograph on Italian resistance and food justice from the perspective of the Italian rural world. My book investigates the role and image of the Italian peasant world from the time of resistance, as I said before, during World War II till today, underlying its significance in shaping the origin and implications of the slow food international movement. Examining the writing of intellectuals such as Renata Viganò, Alcide Cervi, Nuto Revelli, Carlo Petrini, and selected documentaries of the of the filmmaker uh, Ermanno Olmi that was mentioned before, 
I argue that contemporary forms of environmental activism rooted in sustainable farming are built on the cultural and historical legacy left in the last century by Italian peasants. A good example I often use when I interact with my American colleagues and my students, and that I will bring, I will uh, use in the closing chapter of the book is the case of the Slow Food International Network of Terra Madre. Founded in 1986, Slow Food surfaced during the same years that Italy opened its doors to the first fast foods. While Slow Food's uh, initial goal was to support quality, taste, local food traditions and experiences, its current mission also includes to push back the fast life that damages environments, ecologies, and threatens the extinction of biodiversity in the planet. Today, Slow Food is the largest and most instrumental nonprofit grassroots movement in Italy. Since the beginning, Carlo Petrini understood the crucial role of local food traditions and rural cultures. Only locally, Carlo Petrini says, it is possible to render fertile both the biodiversity of nature and the cultural diversity that results from it. For food culture, and not only food culture, has to be formed in connection with context with the resources available in local area, with ecosystems, and with one's relationship with one's neighbors. The contemporary global market, and often our knowledge of food products are limited to a small number of producers compared to the number, numerous local varieties cultivated where we live and around the world. The work of slow food to sustain biodiversity and small scale farmers who use traditional practices address and are the solution to mitigate this problem. This is indeed the root end of the idea of Terra Madre, a meeting of food communities from throughout the world held in Italy, in the city of Turin actually, Claudio, uh, every two years. Small scale farmers, shepherds, fishermen, but also chefs, educators, and consumers gather and exchange information and ideas, as the rest of the world. In 2020, Terra Madre dealt with the consequences of the global pandemic. The event went, in fact, virtual, turning the challenge of the lack of the physical presence into a great opportunity to reach more people around the globe. From October 2020 to April 2021, Terra Madre organized a series of events online. The central theme, as you can see, was our food, our planet, our future, addressing the direct link between the food we eat, the planet that hosts us, and how our action will affect the future. The critical role biodiversity plays in counteracting extinctions of species and cultures is what implied my, uh, it's what inspiring um, and what I'm planning in my current research project. My current project and present project grows from the research of my book and aims to create more visibility and awareness of the marginal areas of the Alpine mountain arc in the regions of Lombardy, Piedmont, Valle d'Aosta, and the area, areas touched by France, Switzerland, Austria, and uh, also Germany and Slovenia. This is an interdisciplinary project that will involve the collaboration with Italian and European institutions, geosatellite support, Italian and American universities, and American students. I am currently collaborating with Massimo Gianna, a promoter of rural development who has extensive experience in Valtellina and works on projects supported by regional, national, and European funding. Our project will be submitted to the Interreg Alpine Space Program, which is co-founded by the European Union. It will include an interactive virtual geographical map of the food communities that employ traditional knowledge and technique in the cultivation of local produces. The project's objective is to connect these realities among each other, enhance the visibility of local and regional rural mountain cultures, 
with, while promote, promoting also sustainable forms of ecotourism. According to Miguel Altieri, traditional farming knowledge needs to be recognized as a science with the same dignity of all other sciences and integrated by finding a synthesis between the two approaches. And I quote, appropriate technologies should be based on indigenous knowledge and rational, be economically viable, accessible, and based on local resources be environmentally sound and socially, culturally, and gender sensitive. There should no longer be a top-down approach with farmers as passive recipients of information, but, but farmers should exchange information within farmers' networks, supported by organizations ready to commit to the agenda of farmers. The 2021 FAO report on food insecurity stresses the need to reinforce the resiliency of local food systems. This project will offer new transnational dialogues between different actors so that following the ideas of Terra Madre and agroecology, agroecological practices, they can create networks of information among each other. I am currently working, drafting the project proposal to submit it for funding. Actually, I had a talk just this morning before this meeting with Italy. Uh, to, conclude this, to conclude my little presentation, this project will incorporate the participations of students in the research and the translation in English, and is seeking the collaboration with other departments that would be interested in creating applications for the, for the map, becoming ultimately a virtual map that will offer a deeper understanding of these marginal areas of Italy and the Alps that hold a great historical and cultural source in the Italian and European panorama. Thank you very much. Excellent, Ilaria. Grazie. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, I'm in Torino, very close to everything you talked about. And I just uh, came back from uh, a visit to Polenzo. Um, so I'd like to invite Graziella to pose the que first question. And again, uh, if the audience has any question, please uh, write it in the Q&A. Thank you for this great, great presentation. I really, really enjoyed it, Ilaria. Um, I would like you to go a little bit more in depth yes. um, in the discussion. Uh, and I would like to bring in a discussion of, of class issues. On the one end, you're talking about um, applying indigenous studies to um, the history of farming in, in Italy, right? So you are focusing on that. And on the other, slow food emerges. And slow food is a very interesting, but sort of very problematic at the same time entity, right? Uh, the consumers of slow food are people belonging to very particular social classes. They are not, they, it, it cannot be a, replace, a replacement from the hamburger you buy at McDonald's. So I am interested in this sort of position in different, position in different interest, interests. Uh, and I could elaborate a little bit more, but I'll let you uh, talk about that. Thank you very much, Graziella. And uh, yes, so I'm gonna take the three key words that uh, it seems your question uh, wants to address. So the issue of class with uh, rural and peasant cultures and uh, slow food as a problematic example. And uh, again, maybe intersecting with class and elitism, I would also add, and then indigenous studies. And when I think of indigenous studies, I'm also very interested in the, in the definition of indigeneity. So uh, let's start with slow food and then I'll try to address everything. Uh, this is actually a question I asked uh, Carlo Petrini in my interview that is in the volume that I mentioned, because it is true, you know, uh, slow food, especially I would say 10 years ago, it was very much more uh, an elitarian way of addressing to gourmet food. And so who can afford gourmet food? Not surely, not the rural class who is the one who is producing. But it is also true that Carlo Petrini and Slow Food acknowledge their roots 
in the land. And so actually they acknowledge the, the producers. And that is when that shift happened with Terra Madre, which started in 2004, 2006, even grow in 2008, finally exploded uh, to the point that right now, biodiversity, uh, having dialogues with um, indigenous cultures worldwide, because let's not forget that slow food is an international movement right now. It's not only related to Italian culture. It represents to me, and that is the reason why slow food started in Italy, but it's not anymore only about Italy. And then uh, when it comes to indigenous cultures, finally, it is what I would call an act of cultural humility that not only Carlo Petrini, but slow food does in recognizing that to reconnect to not only to the land, but to certain uh, forms of biodiversity and bioregions, you need to uh, readdress what uh, the so-called uh, first country or uh, Western countries, first world countries, however we wanna call ourselves, have destroyed somehow or suppressed. I don't know if I, and when it comes to class, I don't even know if we can really call class rural cultures because they were not even allowed to be part of certain decisions in the making of uh, uh, social and political, uh, you know, in Italy and, and often in other countries. I don't know, Graziella, if I addressed your question, but. Uh... Well, if I may, um, I was really talking even just, I mean, if we're limited to the discourse on the on consumers class, I mean, I do understand the need to go back to more traditional uh, forms of farming. That means also uh, farming uh, very much smaller allotments and therefore producing a limited amount of food. That food comes up to being a, a very expensive and therefore it is food that will be available for a particular social class of people will not available in order to train people to move away from fast food that that is not going to happen so that's that's the issue that sometimes i find myself having with um this sort of attractiveness attractiveness of slow food it's extremely attractive but i don't think it, it addresses uh, the issues of of uh, who it is talking to, speaking to, or producing for. Well, um, I, I I I partially uh, I, I understand where you're coming from, and I partially um, agree because, especially where I am located right now, and uh, probably Dartmouth might have a similar situation. But here I am in a rural university and I am surrounded by um, in monocultures and sometimes uh, small scale farming. The truth is that what a small scale farming is doing is really practicing uh, some of the um, ideas that Terra Madre and Slow Food are claiming. Now, who do does, so that's where the theory and practice somehow should go together. And so again, when we think of farmers markets, for example, that's what they bring the community together. And, um, and that happens both in urban and rural areas. I see a difference between the American reality and the Italian realities. And we all know that the farmers market in Italy, for example, there are not really farmers most of the time. Um, but there is a, oh, there are a lot of issues, but I think when it comes down to class, you're right, there are finally different things happening. And even FAO is realizing that and the United Nations and so on. Uh, when we talk about food insecurity so and uh, food sovereignty, we can think that um, fast food are going to save the, the problem of hunger, for example. No, I mean, uh, I totally understand that, yeah. That's so anyway. Sorry, I've, I've taken up too much time. Yeah, so, you know, my grandfather was a contadino, you know, not a glamorous one at all, you know, one of the, so I have lots to say, but I guess my question will end up um, as a follow-up, in fact, to what Graziella was saying. There is to say, you know, it's about the question of class, but from another way, what is the relationship of slow food or terra madre to capitalism, frankly? Because, you know, I think slow food is, is embraced pretty um, readily, uh, capitalism, you know, um, slow food products are sold at Italy. Um, Terra Madre seems, from what you say, slightly more critical. But again, how, how deep or how much do you question capitalism as the mode of, uh, in fact, Absolutely. expanding? 
So on one level, I think uh, Carlo Petrini is a pretty smart uh, um, manager and politician because it's kind of in the way he uh, organized and, uh, and direct and manage both, uh, you see, slow food on one level and terra madre on another, and I use those two examples, he tries to create conversation with institutions. And I think it's there that where there is the problem of elitism. And an example very interesting is uh, the University of Polenzo, where there is, is the first agro uh, food uh, university where you can find the richest uh, students because it's a private university, with the one that got the fellowship and they just have this different kind of uh, uh, way of uh, pursuing their career in a practical way. Now, talking about the economic part, yes, he embraced absolutely the capitalist uh, way of thinking in terms that he, he made certain, certain price, uh, certain foods are not affordable. On the other hand, you have to think that those like little uh, slow food label that now there are the Presidia, there are so many of these different slow food uh, labels in Italy especially, are kind of a way for these small scale farmers to create some sort of visibility and give quality and dignity to their products. Um, there are many others we know like DOP, DG and all these other uh, European labels that are in they're helping to create some sort of um, safeguard to the quality of, uh, and the, of the produce. But I think the problems of the economic uh, issues of capitalism in general is one of the things that I find uh, essential to change this paradigm and shift of consciousness that I talk. Um, in Europe and, uh, and also in the United States, we're finally talking of alternative economic systems, one that has been talked uh, a lot and in Terra Madre several times is part of, a, of the conversation is the La Decrescita Felice in, Ita in Italy, degrowth in France, post-growth in the United States. These are alternative economic systems where value uh, beside the, the economic part, they try to kind of uh, bring down the idea of the economic growth for the sake of economic growth, for the sake of profit uh, at, in itself, but actually bring back into the conversations other, uh, other values. Collaborations is one of them. Exchange is one of them. And so that is a little more horizontal than vertical compared to the capitalist system, if I answer your question. Yeah, you do. Again, Claudio, can I follow up pretty briefly? So are we talking Pasolini, you know, Svilupo and Progresso, or are we talking a more radical kind of economic? Because again, elitism is a cultural category, you not know, an economical one. So are we invoking that? I, I would say that, um... The way I look and, and the way I use my research is a little more radical uh, because like you're saying, when we talk about uh, Pasolini and this Viluppo and Progresso, which is very interesting, but it still comes from a, a, an intellectual educated person, not that, and pay attention, I'm not saying that the farmers are not educated, absolutely not. They're very much more educated, especially today's in the 21st century than uh, in other centuries. But I'm talking of a more like, from below, from the grass, a civil society, a civil society that is taking, uh, um, is taking back, you know, like in their hands, their, uh, their future. And uh, we're talking like, uh, finally, there are, there is this international um, peasants organizations and where there are all these different organizations like La Via Campesina, for example, and that in Italy also is present and that with slow food, they are creating conversations. Um, and I know slow food has a lot to do if it wants to you know, change the, the kind of uh, rightly so uh, idea that slow food is a, an elitist uh, movement. It, it has a lot to work to do. And I talk about that in my book. We have one minute left. Well, I will exercise my right to, to ask a, a question since I don't see any other. Um, I, I love the way that uh, both Graziella and Stefania went uh, to, towards the question that I think we all come up with uh, for as much as 
we probably are very much attached to slow food, uh, but we are also aware of our class nature. But I'm actually trying, would like to reverse it. Um, Ilaria, could you, if we, if we were doing a kind of Gramscian analysis of Petrini and Farinetti as the sort of organic intellectuals of a, of a peasant, of a post-industrial peasant uh, revolution, uh, would, you, would you be able to articulate a position? Uh, and of course, I'm being provocative, but I'm following up. And yeah, to... absolutely. Actually, I use that uh, my 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 title of my book. It is a uh, uh, food justice and Italian resistance: new or, new organic intellectuals. So I wouldn't fully consider Farinetti, not for sure. I mean, Farinetti and Petrini, you can consider them organic intellectuals just because of their backgrounds, maybe where they come from. We know that Farinetti was a, the, belonged to a family of industry. He, you know, of a local industry. If I remember well, they were not. They were not. He wasn't even about food. It was like about shoes or something like that. And then, but he still kept his connection with the, uh, his rural ancestry. Okay, so his family. Carlo Petrini, Carlo Petrini, before being the founder of Slow Food, he was a wine connoisseur. He was part of Arcigola. He was a, an, an enologo. So he, but he knew the Lange. So again, what did he really do? He's been able to. I mean, we can deny that if now Lange is part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it is also because of Barolo and Barbaresco and Nebbiolo and Slow Food. Uh, Brought, uh, a, brought has its own part. So to me, the organic intellectuals, the new organic intellectuals are the farmers, are the one they know they we can teach from, we can learn from, they can teach us to reconnect to the soil, to what we eat in a much humbler way. And that's my hope, obviously. I'm a visionary right now and idealistic as a scholar, <laughs> as we all are, I think. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank uh, Laura, Julia, and Ilaria, and Stefania and Graziella for being here. But before we close, I would really love to invite Dr. Fabrizio Renzi, the president and CEO of our sponsors, RNB for Culture, uh, to say a few words uh, before we close. Uh, so welcome, Fabrizio, and thank you for being here. And thank you for your generosity in establishing this award. Thank you. Okay. First of all, uh, good. good uh, thank you all. The three the three presentations were very very interesting, and uh, now the, the jury has a deep, very difficult task. So I will let uh, them handle. Uh, and I'm looking forward to see who is the winner on the 9th of December. By the way, the three of you are winner in, in my personal view. Just a, a short address. And I'm very, very happy that uh, together with Cinzia and, and the, the ISNAF team, uh, we introduced this uh, focus on the humanities for two reasons. One, because it's also my personal path. I am a bad engineer. And I spent all my life as a scientist and engineer in IBM. I was the head of research for Italy, Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And now I am an entrepreneur in the last two years. And uh, basically, I'm making much more money from uh, my companies working on IT, but they are pretty boring. Now I have one company working on culture, and this one I have a lot of fun. It's my favorite. By the way, when, when uh, sooner or later I will let someone else handling the, the IT boring uh, things and uh, focusing on this. And at the moment uh, I am uh, focusing on culture. I am doing software for uh, museum and I'm handling directly six museum and in my people of young people in discovery have about 30 people. Two thirds of them comes from humanities and this is fantastic. And it's really fantastic. And the moment I'm handling Brera in Milano for the botanic, orthobotanic, I'm nine in Venezia and Cremona and I'm nine at the top of Venezia, Frederick II and Yesi and so on. But why is so important and why is so important the role you have a professor in humanities? 
because I believe the future is not for engineer because the computer are, uh, are able more and more to program from themselves. Therefore, there is much less focus on programmer. We need people like you that give sense to the world. And thank you very much for this. And thank you very much for our friends from ISNAF that are promoting uh, this fantastic era. Grazie, Cinzia. Grazie, Enrica. That's a pleasure to see you also virtually. I'm looking forward to see you real now that Biden has reopened the frontier now. So at least in New York, I will land uh, soon. But I'm, uh, I will, maybe I will try to come over also in the uh, Pacific. Huh? Really, I'm missing very much uh, you all. <clears throat> Good. And congratulations again, dear friends. Thank you so much, Fabrizio. And uh, I will um, close this uh, by thanking Cinzia and uh, thanking, of course, Enrica, uh, who have been the organizers in chief and Carlotta Borromeo, who has been helping uh, us all uh, to organize this. Um, I really, really uh, thank you all. And again, we will see you all, hopefully also our audience on the 9th of December. Bye-bye to everybody. Grazie, thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Grazie mille, ragazzi. Ciao. Grazie mille.